you. Now, we just sort of played that off the That's cuff, right. didn't we? Very much so. <laughs> and, but we have been rehearsing all our lives <laughs> to do that. <laughs> now I tell people, and people would say, well, they That's worked true. out these great arrangements on the old friends album, and Alan would say, well, no, we didn't. We decided about three months in advance what tunes, you know, we kind of came to an agreement. I sent him 25, and he sent me 25, and I said, okay. Then we agreed on them, and then we went over there and decided who'd kick it off, and how many times through, and who'd, who'd take, uh, if there was a harmony thing, what, how would we do that? And we didn't even do that half the time. We just recorded them. Well, that sounds pretty good. the next one. And people said, well, those are great arrangements you worked out now, and insisted we hadn't. And then Joe said, Joe Carr pointed out, though you've been working all your life, <laughs> which is, in a very real sense is true. That's right. We just happen to uh, understand, well, uh, working with, you know, professionals. We're, all, we're old friends. There you go. <laughs> yes. And I'm the taller of the two on the album. <laughs> oh, yes, I wondered about that. I wondered about that picture, which was which. Two pictures. <laughs> Does anybody, is this, no, these are workshops, aren't they? Yeah. Does anybody have questions? Like, how the hell do you do that? How do you know where to put your fingers? That's what I'm You were old friends from, like, when did you first meet? When you were teenagers or, or something? Or what? I started writing tabs in 72. And then I wrote one on Alan in the old Mule Skinner News on his version of Dusty Miller that he recorded with Sam on the first Poor Richard's Almanac album, which if you don't have, is a real sad thing. And uh, you have it, don't you? <laughs> and um, he, I wrote, he wrote me a letter thanking me, and I thought, my God, somebody actually thanking you for doing something. I wasn't getting paid, by the way, for any of that. It's Fred Bart's thing, a clever idea for publishing a magazine. Nobody got paid except him. And, um, and uh, then I met him in uh, 19, wasn't it 73? Probably no, so. 72, because you came out with the country set. Right, right. And uh, Clarence had just passed on, right. was killed in an accident, and Roland had joined the band to replace Kenny. Right. Kenny Wurtz. So that's a long time, isn't it? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's old friends. That's old friends, yeah. Uh, uh, any questions about music making on banjos? Or? All right, thank you. <laughs> well, maybe you could talk a little bit about improvising with them or playing in a different key. Pick, you know, pick some frequently asked questions that you get. FAQs, FAQs. Well, how, how do you play together? Well, if you, if you can tell, what we did in each case there, just to be a quick, quickly analyzed, was Alan played the melody first and I played accompaniment. And I do a kind of a thing that's kind of like I try to do what the Texas guitar players do. You know, they run a bass line with them. And they'll the strum going for the violin and it's just filler in the contest. And I'm trying to think, what would I do if I were playing, what notes would I play on the guitar if I were using the background? And so I try and think, well, let's pretend I'm the bass player. And then I get real confused because the notes aren't the same. Up usually, but anyway, what I'm doing here really is kind of like you would do on a guitar, just you know, except I'm doing that claw hammer thing. So the beat is always on the upbeat, the strum's always on the upbeat, and the bong sound is always on the downbeat, or something like that. One, and two, and And I play the fifth string as lightly as possible. I don't want to do that. And then, hey, long time no see. How are you? Good to see you. Um, and then Alan, after he took one, I took one, and I tried to play just the melody too, with a, a little embellishment, not much, because it was first time through. And first time through, I tried, as you heard Alan do, he played pretty straight ahead mouth. Well, the, then he took his second solo, mm -hmm. yeah. and he got to improvise a little, but what he did really is he just played the solo, uh, the melody up the neck. Right. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it works, you see. Uh, if you want to learn to improvise, learn how to play any tune you can up the neck, too. If you want to learn Banks of the Ohio, you've got it down in G, and it's nice and easy. They're willing to move it up an octave, and let's see how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all right there, it really is, you know.
just have to find it there, too. I'm doing a pizza music thing where it's on the first string here. But you could do it here, too. That's what Alan did. He, didn't you put most of the melody on the second and third string? That's the correct. One on the top? Why do you call it pizza music? Oh, because I worked in a pizza oh, joint oh, for a long the, time. Oh, the, the, yeah. Shaky. <laughs> Shaky's pizza. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I, I mean, just can I make a comment about that? Sure. Uh, when you said that, uh, the reason that the melody is on the first string is because they always organized it to where the melody is the highest note of your chord. So if you played it in a chord style. See, now Alan's doing different chords under the melody note, and that's what makes it sound so new. So if you can find it on the first string, here it is. Woo! Makes you want to cry, doesn't it? Even though he picks her up and throws her in, watches her while she sings. Okay. <laughs> so that's why uh, he would call it, uh, I get the pizza. reference now, pizza music, because if you were to do it as a strum, the only way you can get them. I guess people just hear the highest note as the melody. Second string. Now you've got your first string, which is higher than that. So it makes a difference in the sound of what you're playing on which string you choose to put it on. And it doesn't have to stay, you know, as soon as you start on the first string, it doesn't have to stay on the first string the whole way. You can just stay on it for a small bit or however long you want, and then you can move it to other strings, however <coughs> you feel like doing it. But those are things you have to. Uh, learn to do, you know, and take into account when you're when you say you're going to make an arrangement of a tune. It's, uh, you know, and if you look at it down here. Two the notes melody, on the top. Or, the melody becomes you know, the lowest note right. of all that, and so you. Fifth string going to ring, and the first string is going to do something too. That's that's pretty typical Earl style. Yeah. You still so, do first string melody like Home Sweet Home. Sure. So it makes a difference, you know, and you have to have the technique and know the roles uh, that accomplish playing the melody on the first string, the second string, or the third string, and the fourth string. And so, you know, it's quite a brilliant little pull off that we take yeah. here. <laughs> Pretty high level. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're laughing. They're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, am I being funny? No, I'm being serious. So You're being seriously funny. Yeah. Okay. But you do have to kind of get those, take those things into account. Yeah, you really do. And so, when you work on arrangement, as I was saying in the last workshop, can you hum it? Can you hum the tune? Can't hum the tune. You're going to have trouble finding it on that fingerboard. Believe me. 
So the first thing you have to do is that. Hum the tune. Now, even if you can't write, now you'll get to where you can. Just tell yourself you're going to do this. And lo and behold, you'll make a million excuses why you can't. But that million and first time should be charmed for you. you know, so. Really, you can. You wouldn't be interested in music if you couldn't carry the tune somehow. Well, at least in some key. It may not be the same when you play it. But what the heck? You know, you've got the melody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know when uh, musicians are interested in quite a number of things. But one thing they're interested in is training their ear to hear things, so that when they hear it out there, they can find it on their instrument. Or if they hear it in here, they can find it on their instrument. And it's, in a sense, it's like a language. You don't learn a language by reading about a language and then trying to make it work. You learn by listening. And uh, if we waited for every kid uh, to diagram a sentence before they could actually talk, uh, you know, <laughs> you wouldn't be anywhere. They all just learn by listening and, and imitating. And that's how you learn to play. One way you learn to play music or develop your ear is by trying to imitate sounds. And, you know, if you have the patience of a newborn to wait until however old you have to be to make sentences, you'd probably be a better player because you'd have more patience with yourself in trying to find these things on your instrument and not, you know, hitting two notes and then giving up because, you know, I couldn't find it. But it just takes a long time, you know, and to get your ear to where you can hear uh, what's going on. Uh, so it would probably be faster if you're trying to do that and play too because you're working different parts of the brain and that's good for the brain muscle. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it is, really. I mean, mm -hmm. Don't put your banjo away and say, okay, I've got to be able to hum red wing. Or I can don't do that. Hum red wing and then try it. And go back. Oh, and yeah. And you want to, because uh, unlike, well, <coughs> in a sense like uh, speaking, it involves all these muscles and your lips and tongue and vocal cords. But playing music involves your fingers, so you have to rehearse those, them too, you know, they have to know where it is. And uh, a lot of times, if I go to tune and I hear a note and I know it's, the string is not in tune, actually it's in the muscles of my hand rather than in my ear to a certain extent. And that I'll, re I'll just know which way to turn it without even really vocalizing or thinking, well, it's sharp or flat. It's just in the muscle of which way to turn this. But at one time, it was, is this sharp or flat? Right, exactly. But it becomes like driving. When you drove here, how many of you can remember the drive, not counting the scenery? I asked my students when I was still teaching, I said, how many of you can remember what you did on the drive in? And they can tell you about the phone calls they made and the radio stations, but they can't tell you. Then I said, well, how many times did you stop? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> because you don't think about that. And you can, and then again, you can play as put your hand on someone who's actually wearing a tie and ask them what kind of tie do you want. And see if they know. Chances are they won't. Well, Wayne, well, yeah, I've heard some musicians say, you know, it, if I think about it, I'll screw up. So I don't want to, you know, like who said that you can't think and hit at the same time? <laughs> Yogi Berra. But, but you two strike me as more analytical than most musicians. Is that, you take that, you think that's true? Well, uh, we may understand it to be able to talk about it, but when you play, it goes by way, way too fast, you know, to have that. And once again, uh, it's sort of like uh, language in the sense that uh, we're all involved in uh, conversations all the time, and never once do we write it down and memorize what we're going to do, or what we're going to say. And music, at some point, becomes sort of that. I mean, your fingers just know where to go because you've gone there a lot, a lot of times, and you just do it because it's just there. And But it took a lot, a lot of practice to get to both of those places, to yeah. be able to speak just, and then to... Just like having a good vocabulary. Yeah, yeah, you have to work, you have to read. Uh, okay. <laughs> Can I speak to that just a, a moment? You may. Uh, I like this, because I like the analogy between language and music. And uh, there's this melody in bluegrass that happens a lot that is this. What kind of
kind of language do you use to express that? And banjo players have several different ways, and one way might be like this. Right? Or they might do this. So you have all what I call synonyms. So every time you hear that melody, you know or the meaning was you have these things that you can do that expresses that that you've rehearsed right. and practiced. And so you have this vocabulary that you can pull out just like you have a vocabulary when you speak. And uh, so somebody and this how how do you play a song you've never heard before? Well, because you may never have heard that song, but you've heard hundreds like it, and so you just play. There's only so many notes and so many series. It's incredible how much music, how many songs are between here and here. I mean, just yeah. Uh, they're all there. And so if you know how to manipulate and know the, all the little synonyms and vocabulary of banjo playing, what I call it is you're playing melodies with a banjo accent or a brogue, a banjo mm -hmm. brogue. And fiddle players play it one way and singers sing it one way, but we do it like this. have to learn those and practice them. And uh, after you get a number of these, then you, in addition to that, you listen to other players when they do that same thing, and you notice if they do it differently. And somebody mm -hmm. does it differently, then you go, oh, I like that. Hey, that's interesting. You ask them how they did it, or you sit down and try to learn it yourself. Oh, I see he's doing uh, or some little... I, just threw that out. Uh, some little thing that does that, and you add it to your vocabulary. It's like learning a new word, you know, and then you use it in a sentence, so to speak. So it's the process of, first of all, being able to move your fingers and do all that, and then sort of gathering up those kinds of things, so that when, when you talk about improvising, to a certain extent, it's really not playing something you've never played before as I'm improvising what I'm saying, but I'm using in the English language, you know? And so it's and you're understanding it too, so there you are. So it's how you put these little units together. Mm -hmm. And I read a, uh, I'm gonna stop. This gentleman had a question. Um, I've made my point. Well, I was going to say hours ago, though. Go ahead. <laughs> well, it can't be said too much. <laughs> Whoever said that. Whatever smart Alex pointed that. Can you uh, play that same um, melodic idea in a melodic style of playing? Just like, yeah. uh, really that might be that. It's a way. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, can, if I can make this point, is the melodic style, people always ask, well, how would you play that melody in a melodic style? And I go, well, in my, for me, I can't. I mean, I could play a break that had this melodic stuff, but all of a sudden, it wouldn't be the tune anymore because the melody to songs usually are just two or three notes a measure. Where in the melodic style, all eight notes are pretty much are, are the melody. So in a sense, you're substituting eight melody notes for one melody note, for three melody notes, let's say. And all of a sudden, it's like, well, that's not that melody anymore. So uh, you could play a melodic break that has some essences of that, in that it starts on a B and ends on the G, let's say, uh, which is pretty good. Right. But all of a sudden, it's not... All of a sudden, it's this other thing. So you can't, for me anyway, I can't play a melodic uh, Blue Ridge Cabin home because it's too many notes. It's, 
not Louise Cabin Home anymore, but you can right. play a melodic solo. What Alan is saying is that one has Thank to you, develop Wayne. any taste. <laughs> <laughs> well, one has to what? Develop taste. taste. Ah. Well, if we had taste, we probably wouldn't be playing the band. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was going to come up. <laughs> so, Alan, uh, and Wayne, could you talk to us a little bit about um, your master of passing tones, and you use them all the time, too. And, um, you know, really, what? passing tones. Um, tones. <laughs> um, that's something that uh, oh. people go on and don't want to do 145 anymore. Um, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about. <laughs> well, when I was doing that claw hammer thing earlier, uh, what I was doing was thinking what notes will fit here as harmony notes and what notes will suggest what's to come. That's what a passing tone does suggest when you're in the old little darling pal of mine. And the melody might be, oh little darling, but you've heard a lot of people kick off. John Henry kicks off that way, or John Hardy, and John Hardy is, and oh now John Hardy, no it's just John Hardy was, and so on. And so when I'm walking up, the next note logically, if it's fast in the beginning, it's going to be that note. Seven in showing that maybe we're going back to the four chord. The idea is is you use them to, to do two things. It goes back to, to you know restraint and taste and music and so on and so forth. There's a million things. Alan isn't being forceful enough with this. There's a million things you can do with a banjo, and that's why there's so many banjo jokes. <laughs> because people too often to do everything they know in one break, <laughs> at a jam session especially. And, but if you think of it, what will make this song, or even tune, I think of a tune as no words and lots of notes, and a song as that which comes worth <laughs> And I try to think, <laughs> what's going to make this song sound good? And Elliot has a song that he likes to do, we do in the band. Now most of what I do in the whole piece is this. And that to me is all the song needs to be very slow anyway. And then I do one little piece of a break and I do this. that by doing that scale. What's next? The C. There it is. And what those are are not bluegrass chords. I mean, you have to understand the genre, too. There, there are things you do in, in bluegrass traditionally. That's one thing. And when you, when you move into other things, you're really actually trying not to just play a style, you're actually trying to play music within a style. And that's important. That's what everybody, that's what Alan does. And that's what a lot of banjo players who, who you like to listen to do, and that's why you like to listen to them. They can find those notes that are... And Alan knows a million great chords that way too, as he was showing you on that okay, 400,000, but he knows <laughs> how to do something like on that Banks of the Ohio where he was throwing those colors of the chords in there. He couldn't do that if he didn't know every one of those chords very well and hadn't played them maybe 500,000 times, you know, just to keep them, well, this is a nice sound, and in this melodic context, a very simple melody for Banks of the Ohio, five notes, I think. <laughs> several different kinds of chords that enhance the melody in people's hands. Yeah. Uh, one thing, and there's a lot of, you know, you could talk about theory, and there are people who've been talking on uh, a long, long time about music theory and how chords operate in one thing and another. Uh, and I'll just make a quick comment about music theory. A lot of people have this sort of fear of it, 
but really what music theory is, is really smart people listening to music and making observations about what musicians are already doing. And, you know, they just listen and go, you know, it seems like this is happening, and it seems like it happens all the time when this happens, and they write a little guideline down. And that's what music theory basically is. But you talk about passing tones. I was just sitting here thinking, there's a G mm -hmm. chord, and you want to go to C, and you put your fingers down like that. If you just look physically, the distance between uh, on each string, the difference between the G and the C, there's the fourth string. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a note in between. So How there's, did you get there? There, you know, so you're in Walk G. Out. And that same note is over here. And if you look at a G note, which I'll take here, and if you look at the distance, you have to go down to get to that note of the C chord. There's another set of... So there, I mean, it's just this physical thing. There's a distance between the notes of one chord and the notes of another chord on each string. And if you sort of studied them, you would have passing, what are referred to as passing tones. So if that was here, if you look at this G, to go to this C, well, if you just played that note, that's called an augmented chord. But all it is is the note that's in between the two notes. See, here, there's the note of the G chord. And we're going to go to this. If you look at that string, so that's, now if you put two of them together, and this, you get this, and you get an augmented seventh, and you could have studied how that works and know the theory of it, but in a sense, it's just sort of geographic, mm -hmm. you know? Study your positions. So there you go. Which is the same one you had over here, which is the same one you had over here. They're just in different places on the neck. And if a lot of songs, this is real cool to me. They can explain it, I'm going to explain it this way. When you're on the fork, you're in key and G, and you're on a C chord, chord-wise, there's two basic ways of playing a chord that goes back to G. One of them is this, just look at it here. There's the note of the G chord. There's the note of the C chord. There's a note in between. If you play that, that's called C minor. Can you hear how that... way. The other way is if you look at this C note, you, it could go up to get back to the D of the G chord. And you have this, which is called C sharp diminished. But it's just a geographic. I mean, there's can be more to it than that. So if you have red wing... Good, but you can also just the geography of it. 
And just the sound of it, too. Once again, we get back to it. How does it sound? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> music. Yeah, music. All of them. And uh, you just take those two ways of getting from C back to, to uh, G, and then you learn them everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> in different positions. Right. Yeah, first shape like this, and this shape, this shape, and where is the minor for each one? A lot of times what I'll have my students do is, okay, you know how to play all those chords, and I'll play the minor forms of each one. So that, and I tell them, I even make them learn things like, where is the third tone? Oh, okay. definitely. Here. There. And then here it's there. <coughs> what you have to do to make a minor is to take that tone down a half step, see? Mm. Understanding that a little bit too doesn't hurt. Mm. And here. And again, so if you're maybe at, at a D and you want to go back to a G, you just walk back up to that, see? Because you could be saying, you know, something like the augmented again. And a lot of that third tone, when you hear the pedal steel players, that's what they're playing. Like. <coughs> they do. And they do a whole step usually. You know, you can, and, and fifth tone too. Scale 12 if you're being real. Always, uh, there's a joke, and I can't remember the joke, how it's set up exactly, but the guy claims he can walk on water and you've had some a friend and they go out. And this guy that uh, says he can walk on water, in fact, he walks out on the water and comes back, and the other guy tries and falls in and says, How do you do that? And he says, Well, it's real easy when you know where the rocks are. <laughs> so, if you look, you know, the thing that's always stunning to me is you look at this, and I've got this here, they're all there. Yeah. They're all right there. You just have to learn where the rocks are buried. And uh, they're buried in very similar, I mean, it's in patterns. And uh, you need to really, really spend time. Uh, not only just playing, you know, and doing tunes, which is important, but trying to get a sense of what you're up to and where, what the names of the notes are. Every rock has a different name, and uh, they go together in these patterns that are explained by this thing they call music theory. Uh, but that's, as he said, that's just a description. That's not somebody's idea of how it works. That's just how people do it. Right, so right. They're just describing what is already I happening. Yes, sir. I'll give Brave and ask a question. I'm just learning to play it. So, the melody, am I wasting time sitting around picking, trying to find the melody? No, not at all. I mean, that's I how mean, you learn. That's the word sad. Just, just with my thumb or, you know, one note. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I meant. Find the melody first, then add to it. Yeah, yeah I, I can't add to it. <laughs> well, that's okay. That's but a good place to start. Just like this, right? Yeah. I mean, is that helping you? Or? Oh, definitely. Okay, sure it is. You're learning where the notes, you're learning where the music is on this piece of wood here. That's kind of where the... The rocks are. The rocks are those. And you get to where you things. hear what those those notes are. You know, A, B, you know, try to. I think it's no. good to understand it all. Yeah. Good to understand it all. The other odd thing about stringed instruments is you can find that melody in a lot of different places. 
you know, he played it all basically on open. about it, this tone is found in, in the, on each string. The higher tones are found on each string, right? There's one there, and then there's one about here, and one here, and one here. And that never occurred to me until somebody showed me how to do this. And I thought it should be... Obviously, that's a little harder, although Don Reno never had trouble with it. <laughs> I did, and um, he would do a little more right in here, too, and, you know, travel the neighborhood, you just stay on the little block. <laughs> and, uh, when, and all that meant was that this note was being found here. Here, here, and here, where is there? And one here. And it, that, that, to me, after you get it on maybe one string, find where... I had a little sheet I used to hand out at Camp Bluegrass called Same Note, Different String. No, I don't have any. In other ah. words, play the melody on, play the same melody and find it on the next string and play that same melody. You could, indeed, saying? right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and if you're doing... Okay, you got that much memorized on there. Now why not do it here? Find it on different strings. Same notes you played. Not same positions, obviously. One way to get into it. Yeah, the, that's the d funny part about stringed instruments. Like a piano, there's only one place to get it. Middle C. Middle C. There. Where on the banjo, you can, you know, or in stringed instruments, you can get those notes in several different places. And being able to manipulate those to your advantage uh, is crucial. Is why you practice. Right. <laughs> and you'll find some places, uh, and this is where style comes in. You know, I have students that will play something, and I say, is that, they'll say, is that all right? And I say, well, you know, there's a lot, a lot of ways to play the banjo and make music, and it's good. Style-wise, you're not playing in the style of bluegrass banjo playing. So you have, stylistically, here's what a bluegrass banjo player would do. So there's concessions, you know, like, you could do this, but more, more often than not, they're going to get it over here, you know, rather than up here. And you could say, well, that works, doesn't it? And you go, yes, it works, mm -hmm. and it's music, and there's nothing wrong with it. But if you want to play in the style, my sense of it is that you should do it over here. And it's not, you know, right or wrong, it's just a style question. Mitchell, so. Mitchell Land, whom you know well. <laughs> He's passed on. Oh, all right. <laughs> 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 just thing. kidding, I like Mitchell. Mitchell was a great human being. He was a, a good mandolin player. He had the Stone Mountain Boys for a year, and Alan played with him, Byron played with him, Byron Burleigh, and Eddie Shelton played with him. I'm going to and, uh, uh, <laughs> hey, you know how you have a double negative in English? You're not supposed to use a double negative because it makes positive. Have you ever used a double positive to make a negative? Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, now. <laughs> Mitchell, when I, we, were, we were in a jam session one time, he said, well, let's do this and see. He said, kick it off. And you know, I started kicking it off. He said, no, don't do it that way. And I said, well, why not? And he said, put a capo on the fifth fret. It sounds more like bluegrass that way. And he's right. 
I guess. <laughs> well, someone like Jimmy Martin would dress for sure. It's his sense of style. Exactly, exactly. He's right. Right. From his sense, and I said, okay. So I just thought it was a lot easier. Yeah. Ah. Questions? Let's get this. Well, I'm a wannabe banjo picker. This is probably the dumbest question you ever heard, and you mm -hmm. probably wonder why come I haven't figured not. it out. But how do you know what roles to use when? Not a dumb question. That's the crucial question. That's a central question. Having glorified that question, we can't answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Alan has a great sheep. No sheep. Yeah, no sheep. No sheep today. I didn't have a sheep. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Is today. Well, anyway, he has a sheet that when we, we did a workshop up in Albuquerque about a month ago, and he came up for it. And um, he has a series of, of roles and shows you okay, you're going to play this string three times in, in a series of eight. What can you do with a melody on that string in a series, you know, those three notes in a melody? Because most singing songs, as Alan correctly said, they don't have more than two or three notes. And, and like, don't forget me. Yeah. <laughs> One, two, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but but there are there are roles, and, and if you can do well, what I think where Earl Scruggs was such a genius, he would work a melody into a role. And he had about maybe six patterns he would use at, regularly. He'd use a forward and back, and a forward and a back, and then some and index them in the middle and so on and so forth. And sometimes he'd use his middle finger more than others, but not very often. And, and everything he did worked into that. You can do... <laughs> and right there is a C and a D and a G, mostly a G. And, and as Alan says, you've got a lot of open strings, see? And when you play that melody, try and remember how people sing it when they sing it, because usually they don't leave spaces in the meter, the, the beats and all that. Now, and you see, it really is a good question. It's the same one you asked, too. You struggled with finding the melody. Now what do I do? Well, I tell my students sometimes use a two-finger approach. Index and thumb. Thumb is leading. All I'm doing to fill here is this, back and forth. Thumb hits the fifth string every other note, unless it's hitting a melody. And then the index finger just plays that first string. something with it, just to get the idea that, okay, there are melody here, but then in between, I've got to fill. And if you just use that thumb back and forth thing for now, you get the idea of what you're doing, at least. You know, you, you get an idea of, okay, I'm going to try that. You should try it right now. You should rush out and try it right now, because apparently it throws us out. <laughs> rush right down to your banjos. We had another question here. One here, yep. yeah. and then one more. Uh, you said you mentioned you brought it up when you said play it in C or play it, put the capo on. Uh, I tend to learn a song in G, and then I want to move on to the next song. When do you tell your students like you ought to learn this in G and C, or you know I tend to want to not well, learn it in two keys. I want to 
very easily when, when G isn't so much of a challenge anymore. It's so you're comfortable with it. Now it's time to expand and try playing things in C. Now it's time to expand and play. I listened to Alan Mundy, this guy. I listened to his banjo sandwich album, and uh, it, it, it amazed me. You know, he didn't use a capo on it. It's true. I never thought of that. He didn't use a capo on it. He only retuned a little bit. And he even played in the key of F without using the capo, which was just outrageous to me at the time, you know. But he did, and I learned a lot from that. And then I would listen, I, I heard Peter Wernick uh, play uh, that wonderful version of uh, the Wichita Lineman that he did on that one solo album of his before Hot Rise was it really. And, and he does that in B flat, folks, but he does it out of a G tuning. And that, I didn't think you could do that. Well, you can. And, but the point is, start with one of them first. Start with maybe C first. And don't retune it first, unless you're playing home sweet home where you need that low bass. Here. Same thing with D, you know. When we play, I seldom do anything except hook the fifth string right there. So you get this. If I'm doing backdrop or something. And you don't always need to even hook that. It depends on the song. If there's a lot of G in it, don't hook it. We do a white freight liner in our band, and, and it's a lot of G. And a D. And I stay away from the fifth string. So about the G. And then you can roll on the fifth string. So. But you don't have to stay away from it. Doesn't hurt there. And then an A. Well, the G is part of an A7 anyway. to sound, when does it sound right to do this and when it doesn't, but the same thing applies. You're going to have to hold more strings down in the That's the only catch. Uh, just one quick thing on yours uh, and yours also. Uh, is in this little thing he was talking about, I have a uh, presentation that is playing the same melody on every string and what role you use you know... Second string, third string, and fourth string, and and that is by no means the only way they are done. <coughs> but it gives you that beginning sense of how you choose a role. <coughs> Basically, it's where you want the melody. Uh, and as you get more sophisticated in all this, I can't explain it. It just happens. And then the other thing on playing in other keys, and I always use Lonesome Road Blues as an example, is that if you learn, if you've learned to play it. Uh, sort of in the Earl Scruggs. That right there. It doesn't have any open strings other than the fifth string. So when that happens, uh, you can just take those positions and move them somewhere else and play the same relative positions and you get it in another key. Here it is in the key of F. Same positions, just everything's down two frets. Here's D. fifth string, and I sort of chose keys that the fifth string would sound all right with. And there's some of them you would probably more want to change it than leave it where it is. Uh, and th say we were going to do it in D, because uh, uh, 
then what you do is you say you do the first part. I mean, I said D, didn't I? Right here it goes to G. Well, instead of going, when you get to G, you're kind of home base. Home free. So you can start doing other things. find places that you can do other things than just the closed stuff. Right. So that would be sort of an entryway. One other quick... God. That's all right, go. That's all right. Because this comes with, down to music theory. It's sort of... Music theory can inform your ear. You know, if I told you something and that was theoretical and then you tried it and then you go, you go, oh yeah, I, that sound. Well, then it becomes that sound rather than the theory. And one of them is if you know the intervals that you're playing. And the interval is just the, where it is in the scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if you played the fifth note, if I did that little thing, that's a real bluegrass thing. That's the fifth tone of the G scale, the flatted third, the second, down to the first. Okay, if you can do the same thing in C, if you know the C scale, here's the fifth in C, flat at third, second, down to the first. In D, and so you do the same idea in the different chords, and, it and then you work it out, and it comes out like this. <laughs> scale tones to different places yep. and to different keys and after a while you don't need that information you can just do it you know because you've done it so I'm like reading I'm done are you done I'm done I think we're done well I just wanted to mention um, first of all thank you guys so oh, yeah. much yeah, just, mm -hmm. I wish we had hours of it but his solo no, banjo no. CD is just wonderful and the one they do together with old friends is we could do one old friend. Yeah, I was going to say, why don't you give us a, yeah, place another idea. song? Alan right. also has a oh, wonderful, wonderful, uh, well, tell him about your, your camp in Texas, just right. so tell him about that. No, Wayne happens to be there, too, which right. is a detriment, but we can <laughs> 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 I didn't mean that, Wayne. She didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. What is detriment? He doesn't know what that means. Don't worry about it. Detriment. Yeah. In July, I believe 18th, do you know the date? 18th through the 23rd I'm the third of July, the third week of July, we do a week-long event called Camp Bluegrass at South Plains College in Level Land, Texas. And uh, we get instructors from all over the country. Wayne will be there. We have Chris Jones as a guitar player. Janet Davis. Uh, Janet Davis, who you may know from instruction material, uh, is going to be there. Plus, we have vocal, dobro, bass, guitar, uh, fiddle, and uh, claw hammer banjo. And it lasts a whole week. And it's a real fun thing to do. And it's a real ultimately becomes a real family uh, neighborhood kind of bunch that comes every year. So uh, if you're interested, you can talk to me afterwards or you can go to campbluegrass.com. And it's worth your time and it's very inexpensive considering. Really inexpensive. It's, it really is. So considering camp. that you can buy a package where you go to class it's and stay up all night and play and eat and sleep. It's way cheaper than a bass boat. 
<laughs> it is. A lot more fun. You know. Yeah. That is All levels accepted? All levels? Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Hey, we're going to play we've a We've had Winfield winners come and take classes, and we've had ranked beginners. You know, and they have a great time. I hate to get into this theory stuff, and I shouldn't. We should just but. play. But <laughs> old Joe, this is old Joe Clark. <laughs> Mixolydian, which means we're in a G chord, but we're ultimately what is happening is that it's the scale of the key of C. So you have this, it's got the flat of seventh rather than. So I thought, well, you know, what if you did a tune that used that, but it actually stayed in the key of C? So I wrote a tune that's based on Old Joe Clark. Uh, and I call it, uh, and, right, don't ask me why, because it gets into lots of uh, areas that cause friction. It's called traditional family breakdown. It's called the traditional family breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>